Listen, and you will hear stories of beauty, strength, and inspiration. Let's talk women talk. Dr. Nolene Hazer from Singapore was the first executive director from the Southern Hemisphere to head the UN Development Fund for Women, or UNIFEM. Dr. Hazer was also a 2005 Nobel Peace Prize nominee and has greatly contributed to upholding women's rights in the world. Women Talk TV had the privilege to speak with this remarkable woman on her thoughts on leadership, issues surrounding women, and life. Dr. Hazer, welcome back to Singapore. Thank and, you. Um, thank you so much for spending time with us. Um, let me start by asking you, um, why do you want to start working for the United Nations and what drew you to this field of work? You know, the United Nations has uh, one of the best principles anyway. Uh, its charter uh, is very inspiring. It starts with, we the peoples. And uh, it holds the member states of the United Nations um, accountable to um, make sure that we, the peoples, live in larger freedoms. Uh, freedom from want, freedom from fear, and freedom from all forms of discrimination. Actually, the, the, the charter and these uh, principles um, obviously came out of a very hard period of human history you know, after the Second World War. And there were people who suffered so much and they thought of the next generation. Mm -hmm. uh, they were beyond themselves. You know, they 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 did not think uh, just of the current of of their of their generation, but of um, of the future. Uh, how do they ensure that um, there will be a world where people could build on their uh, on commonalities, where there be shared values, and and what are some of these shared values, and uh, what type of a vision and the principles that will keep. Um, a society uh, more more intact, so that we don't uh, experience the same type of suffering that that they in, and their generation went through. So I'm, I've always been very inspired, inspired by the principles, inspired by the leaders who brought these principles about, uh, inspired by the generosity of thinking of the next generation. So a lot of things brought me to the United Nations. <laughs> now, I also uh, realised and I read that uh, you had a lot of what you called ethical mentors when you were younger and these were yeah. Jesuits and priests from a French tradition. Yeah. So how have what you learned from them, uh, mm. the values that they've taught you, how have they contributed to the person that you are today? I had my education in a convent and then also in St. St. Andrews, so convent of the Holy Infant Jesus and so on. So uh, obviously there were very ethical uh, people around me. And, and at the end of the day, I think they developed uh, a sense of responsibility, but also a sense of a moral compass, of a moral authority. And, and, and uh, I was very lucky because at the end of the day, uh, I think that I was um, also um, trained in the tradition where leadership is service. Now, I know um, you're particularly proud of the UN Resolution 1325. I know it was drafted mm. right out of your office. Yeah. Um, amazing resolution. Um, what were some of the difficulties that you encountered in getting the resolution implemented? Yeah. You know, I, I started as a development worker, right? So I basically spent a lot of my time dealing with issues of poverty, of disparities, um, of wanting to ensure that people have an economic as well as a, f a social um, uh, future uh, that was that so that they can live in dignity. But as I worked, because when I became the executive director of UNIFEM, this is the United Nations Development Fund for Women, I covered the globe. And so it was not just working in poor countries. Uh, it was not uh, working uh, just uh, with the marginalized uh, uh, people uh, who were in vulnerable employment. I was exposed to countries affected by conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saw what it did in terms of tearing the social fabric of the country. I saw what it did to people's lives, um, to women's lives, to children, to the men. And at the end of the day, uh, I became very convinced that there cannot be development without peace. And there is no peace without development. And there are no development and peace without human rights. So, so at the end of the day, I found that there was a lack in the regulatory framework in the, in the UN system when it comes to the protection of, um, of civilians. But, but, but even beyond that, the, how do you use the agency of women? Uh, because you, I, I saw that it, they were victims of war, 
but they were also the people who kept peace in their communities. And yet many of their issues that were so important to the recreation of a new uh, state, uh, to build back better, if you like, and rather than having a state going back to the old, um, were not on the table for negotiations. So, so, so at the end of the day, uh, a group of us came together and said that we need to put this, this agenda um, up front and the highest authority and the highest authority in the UN uh, uh, de dealing with issues of security and peace is the Security Council. So we managed to, to get um, uh, people who were interested in these issues. But of course, the first reaction was that one has women's security got to do with real security, right? So there was a whole misunderstanding of um, what security must mean. And for me, it has to be people's security uh, and, uh, and rather than weapon-based security. And so I think it was not until uh, Afghanistan happened, not until September uh, 11 happened that people realized that the violence in women's life actually was a very good barometer of the insecurities in the country. Because up to then, women were screaming because they were suffering under the, the Taliban in Afghanistan. But nobody paid as much attention as until after September 11. So and I, and I think that we, uh, with, with um, Security Council uh, uh, 1325, we looked at the impact of war um, uh, on women's lives, um, including the use of rape as a weapon of war. Uh, but at the same time, um, we also looked at uh, the contribution of women to the peace process and the reconstruction of the country. And so we started by trying to get uh, women engaged uh, with the bond process. So this was in Afghanistan. And then uh, later on, um, they got very much involved with the Laurel Jilga. And eventually they were able to put, you know, the, the whole, uh, uh, at least influence the, the constitution in such a way that gender equality was part of it and that women were seen as being equal citizens. So for us, it was not a big deal, but for them, it was like the biggest deal to be seen as equal citizens. Uh, but of course, having that incorporated in the, con in the constitution is just the first step, right? So the implementation of that is, 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 is critical. But 1325 has actually been a force for transformation in the, in the UN system and also in the countries affected by conflict because all the the UN entities, if you talk of mainstreaming uh, gender and so on, all the UN entities uh, have had to come, have to have have had to really report on how they have implemented that. So for example, um, uh, if you look at the DPKO, this is the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, uh, they will, they actually have now even have a women uh, civil police. Uh, uh, and then even all the peacekeepers have had to be trained um, in, in 1325 and the military has picked it up in a very big way so I'm very happy with that. And then politically uh, even when you have negotiations now I think you'd be rather embarrassed if you did not have some of the issues that are close to women's hearts on the on the peace negotiating table and women present there and and of course uh, in the electoral process and, and also in, in transitional justice and, and equally um, in the reconstruction of the country. So I think everyone has now uh, incorporated that. Uh, it's still not enough, but it's seen as a mother of, the, of many uh, resolutions from Security Council after that. Now, how do you feel um, being the catalyst to all this um, with regards to women's issues? This journey is never alone. Yeah? So I would say that uh, all of us, are, so a lot of us who are committed uh, in, the, in the same do the same cause, uh, have come together and given each other a lot of support. So for example, um, if I look at um, immediately after 1325 uh, was established, we wanted to uh, create um, a volume called Women, War and Peace. Mm -hmm. And Ellen Johnson Sirleaf uh, was the consultant uh, to that program. And, and eventually, you know, she, she said, uh, actually, I still remember her saying to me when I asked her to be, to work on that, she said, I was the finance minister. I'm not a feminist. Why are you involving me in that? And I said, but you are a leader. And as a leader, you need to understand these issues. And eventually it was women who actually helped her to, to become the first woman president because she understood 
their issues. So, you know, so, so when you see uh, these things, and I, she invited me to her uh, inauguration, and I was very happy because, um, uh, you know, she went through all the things that had, uh, she was promising uh, what she would do. But at the end of the day, I mean, she left the last part in a very powerful way, celebrating the women who voted for her. So I think this has really helped to change the world in a very meaningful way. And, and of course, uh, it, it's so much dependent on the constituency, uh, is whether people understand what this is about, whether they have imbibed this, and whether they have helped to bring it about. Because uh, you know, of course, in its implementation, you can't do it alone. You can inspire, and then you can inspire, but at the end of the day, uh, it, it's people who have to understand. I know there are various challenges working in such a huge international organisation like the UN. How do you overcome these challenges and not let it hold you back from the work, the amazing work that you do? <laughs> well, you know, the UN is an organisation and I think like any uh, organisation, um, individual leadership matters, right? So you can go in there and say, you know what, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to look for all the negatives. Or you can go in and then uh, you take uh, obstacles as part of the human experience, right? So I, whatever obstacles I face is part of the experience of bringing about change, right? And transformation and change is not easy. So if it was easy, uh, then uh, then the change should have happened by itself, right? And obviously, you have to overcome um, hurdles and so on. So that is part of the of the overall process. But what the UN does is that it gives you that legitimacy to to can do it. And I think that I've been lucky because in 1982, I was at the middle, I was a mid-career UN staff. And it was extremely difficult for me to bring about the changes that, that I want. So I left because I couldn't do what I wanted to do. I did part of it, but it was not enough. I didn't go back to the UN until I was a leader, until I was at the top and I could move agendas. So I went back as the executive director of UNIFEM and then I got reappointed as the Under Secretary General of the United Nations for the Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific. So, so in a sense, if you're in leadership position, you can make a big difference if you know how to mobilize the strengths and you can inspire idealism in your team. And, and that, I think, is what uh, has helped one of my staff, uh, uh, actually a very close um, person who works with me, she was my deputy in New York, and she was saying to me, she said, um, we, we became each other's resonant chambers. And I think that, that was, was really something that was very important. What I've tried to do is to build on collective leadership. And I, I have, I think, inspired enough to make sure that there is team and collective leadership. So none of us really get totally worn out because you, when you are tired, somebody else you know, um, can actually come in and do the work. And I think that this idea of what leadership must mean, uh, uh, I think Lao Xu has described it the best when, when, when he says that you can leave and everybody thinks that they are the ones who made it happen. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, really, it's the idea of not being dispensable and yeah. yet giving ownership to people. Basically. Exactly, empowering people, right? basically empowering people, inspiring them and then they are the ones who you know and in the process you also have the energy but 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 you're doing it together so it's not like an individual um, egoistic journey I would love to ask you um, questions on leadership um, you spoke so passionately I read one of your interviews when you spoke about leadership um, of oneness a leadership that required a framework for interaction mm -hmm. um, that there needed to be interaction between communities and countries now, how do you think we can go about achieving that you know, um, leadership actually, uh, if you, I mean, it's, it's for what, right? I mean, so, so in the UN, uh, you, uh, you take on leadership for social transformation because the, the drama of bringing about um, greater uh, social equity, uh, dealing with disparities, dealing with uh, security, peace issues, dealing with humanitarian issues, human rights abuses, and so on, is not and an easy uh, journey. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it is a, a journey that requires um, you to be able to mobilize alliances. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it has to be alliances across uh, different uh, players, if you like. Uh, and so, so uh, we actually look, if you do a power analysis, there are those that uh, would be able to power this journey and make it happen. 
Hmm? So you build on those and you build on their strengths. You are also you also need to be very aware uh, of the the uh, resistance and the resi and the people who are opposing uh, that that uh, journey. And therefore, the idea is how do you weaken that, uh, but but how do you strengthen the whole positive uh, journey? So in any uh, uh, leadership role, I mean, one needs to be very sure of your purpose. I think it has to be a purpose that is inspirational, there's this purpose that address some of the real issues, um, a purpose where there is even um, a collective that would like to complete that, that journey. And luckily, many of the agendas of the UN actually involves uh, a collective. Huh? Uh, but what's so one is purpose, but the other one is the principles. Uh, what principles drive this journey and of course in the UN again we are very lucky because you have a core ethical value uh, uh, as I've mentioned that really uh, helps you to move this agenda because we want a world that is free from poverty, that is freer from, from violence, one that can provide dignity uh, for as many people as possible, one that addresses social exclusion, uh, one that, that really emphasizes the equal rights of all human beings. Uh, so these are all very precious, very, very precious uh, uh, principles and these are shared values. So, so very often uh, it's the fact that it's difficult for people, especially the marginalized, to claim these rights. So how do you uh, empower people in such a way that, that they know that they have rights and that they can influence powers to be more accountable to, uh, to, to deliver uh, a more uh, a just development agenda for them. And I think that, that this increasingly uh, is not just um, about governments and, and communities, it's also about the private sector. Because if we look at the future, one needs to look at uh, what type of a future do we want? I mean, we need to have a more sustainable future. Business as usual is no longer an, an option. Uh, we can't grow in the same way. You can't grow and distribute later. You can't grow and clean up later. In fact, uh, the world is so interconnected that if you pollute the air, all of us breathe the same polluted air. Uh, contagious uh, diseases are not waiting at borders to get a passport. <laughs> 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 yeah. And, uh, and cr transnational crime uh, yeah. also uh, fail to heat borders and so on. So, so increasingly, uh, we need to look at the world as an in interconnected whole and how can we really bring about uh, the best um, or how can you inspire the best of human potential to be able to bring about what I call uh, a more resilient world that is, but is one that is based uh, on social equity on sustainability and, and on shared prosperity. Let me just pick up on that point a little bit. In terms of su su sustainability and, and, and uh, shared equality, how do you think corporates in that sense, or what must be done for corporates to be more sustainable, mm. let's say for example in terms of their supply chain management? Yeah, the thing is that now, um, of course there are many corporations for, because they want a good brand and so on, uh, they will, will look at uh, corporate social responsibility, right? But for me, that's not enough because uh, business plays a major role in the generation of wealth, uh, plays a major role in the generation of jobs, uh, and it can be a good partner. But currently, uh, there's been a breakdown of trust, huh? especially because of the financial crisis, um, especially uh, trust in terms of the, some of the extractive industries, trust in terms of the financial sector. Um, and therefore, the rebuilding of that trust is absolutely critical. Um, and um, it has to be uh, a responsible business conduct has got to be a core part of the business model, is how you do business. Uh, and it's not that difficult because at the end of the day, you can still generate your wealth, but you can generate it in a more inclusive way and you can generate your wealth in a more sustainable way. And i just give you some, some examples because I think that this is a tremendous turning point for Asia. Uh, because Asia, after, especially after the financial crisis, has had to rethink itself because its old model of uh, export growth and being factory Asia 
exporting cheap goods driven by mainly China and of course India, Bangladesh and so on uh, to the G3 countries of Europe, US, uh, Japan is no longer sustainable. So they have had to look at how do you create a more unified regional market? How do you strengthen your, your regional economy? How do you strengthen your domestic economy? So for countries like China, India, more strengthening of the domestic economy. For ASEAN, it would be a regional economy. Um, but in order to make that market work, you need to be able to increase your aggregate demand, which means that you have to improve the income security of your people uh, and, and so that they can participate in the market or else they would not be part of the market. So it means your low wages, uh, the fact that we have unfortunately still uh, in Asia over 1 billion people in informal, casual, vulnerable employment, that has to be changed. Uh, uh, you have to give people the capacity to participate. Uh, and that means you need to strengthen your protection system, your social protection system. You need to increase income security so people can actually participate. But at the same time, um, if you're looking at uh, sustainability, there is no way in which we can pollute our air. Uh, even here uh, in Singapore is the haze. I mean, you can't have um, your plantations um, true, even if they say that, it's the, that, that they're small holders, but you can't in the, the value chain allow your small uh, holders to, uh, to be polluting uh, in the same way and so on. So there has to be greater accountability to what we, how we use our, our ecosystem, huh? um, so the air, the water, even the energy, I mean, the, the way we waste our, our energy, greater energy efficiency, uh, greater access to those who do not have, have enough uh, modern electricity and so on. But the value chain concept um, is very critical because what happened, I think the one, the one thing that, that hits people's really uh, raise our outrage is what happened in Rana Plaza. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that 1,100 women, uh, garment workers, yeah. have had to die uh, in a building that was shaking and they knew that, that the building was unsafe and yet they were forced to get back to work. Uh, uh, and the threat was that if they didn't go in, they would lose their jobs. And they did not have a collective voice. There was no workers uh, uh, organising that. And they were not allowed to organise and so on. So there was no protection whatsoever. So they went in and they all died. And of course, they were part of the value chain that supplied some of the big brands. But the, the good thing now is that there's greater awareness. And also because of the social media, uh, you can't hide any of these things. If you are polluting the waters, if you you are polluting the air, you, you can't hide anymore. If you do not provide uh, uh, safe working conditions, uh, you cannot because you also have ethical consumers. People do not want to buy clothes that have been produced by child labour under sweatshop uh, conditions and so on. So I think uh, in a way it puts a lot of pressure on the, on the corporate sector. And I am very pleased because I think that the corporate sector has a very strong, can play a very strong and good role. But they need to, to take this on, not as a corporate social responsibility, but more as a core business. Um, but, but of course, I think there's still a long way to go because if you look at the financial sector, I'm not sure how much uh, of the rules and regulations have changed so that uh, we don't only look at the too big to fail, but we also look at the too small to matter, the, the people who are living at the sidewalks and not just the yeah. Wall Street uh, Absolutely. people. Mm -hmm. Now, I really admire um, when you said in one interview, you said that it's so important for you to bear witness to the realities of people's lives and that's why you think it's so important to understand the field so well. Now, how does this correlate or does this correlate to the leadership of oneness that you speak of and why? I think at the end of the day, you need to have empathy. I mean, uh, what moves me, of course, is the are real things, right? Because I'm a person that needs to uh, create solutions for real uh, problems. Huh? Uh, and, and, and the only way in which you really get to know what the main issues are and the needs that are crying for, for a solution is to be on the ground, right? Uh, and so I actually spend a lot of my time uh, uh, in whatever job uh, I do touching the ground. 
And, and this has helped me a lot because uh, I can speak with conviction and I, I also am able to put issues onto a table. And it also gives me a lot of courage to speak out because I know uh, what it means. And also uh, courage to organise uh, uh, mainly and, and to bring people together. And I must say that throughout my whole uh, career, I found a lot of goodness. People want, including like, um, as I said, even in the Security Council, they at first they said, what is this? But eventually when I brought women from the conflict zones to, to meet them, they actually got it. So, so, so even if doors are shut at the, at, uh, at the very beginning, it is possible to open doors. But once you open doors, you need to get those people whose lives have been badly affected by whatever forces to walk through them. And that means you have to build capacity. You have to give them a sense of, um, of empowerment. What are some of the most memorable moments you've had in your astonishing career? <laughs> Well, I think so many actually, <laughs> so many. Uh, of course, uh, when Security Council um, passed that that resolution, and then and then I was able to go to all the conflict zones um, to share that, and then to actually mobilize uh, around it. Right, uh, that was uh, really something. And then and, and to see the difference that uh, that uh, that it made. I mean, like throwing up the first woman president. Uh, Go, uh, make, having making sure that there are more women in parliament, uh, making sure that uh, you know uh, uh, issues that we never talked of or that were tabooed were suddenly all just being discussed. For example, you know, um, I remembered in uh, Calibaria, I went to a um, uh, DDR camp. Uh, this was a, a disarmament uh, camp, uh, and um, there was a young girl. There was a she was very, very young, but she was uh, captured as a child soldier, and uh, obviously uh, she she was raped and she had a baby, right? And I still remembered her uh, holding on to me and, and basically saying, uh, you know, um, they will send all the girls to school, but they will not send me because I uh, I have a child. So you know, this whole idea of married girls and girls with babies and and so on. And, and you know and I, I was very pleased to be able to tell her because you spoke and because you dare to to uh, approach me I will make sure that this issue is immediately addressed and of course I went back and you know and this this is the thing I mean the, the ability to bridge different worlds you know to be able to reach the ground to witness things but also to bring it up for a solution and to make it part of the global consciousness and the awareness so that uh, people can actually act on it. And not act on it just like by an, as an individual, but act on it as something that should be addressed because we want to ensure there's human dignity in the world. And is that what you love most about your job? I think I, yeah, I, I love seeing that change is possible and very deep social transformation is possible. So it gives a lot of hope. Because even in the most difficult uh, situation, uh, uh, what I have found is that it's possible to make a difference. And, and that's what has given me a lot of hope, a lot of energy, because I think the main strength is to be able to build alliances. And I have built many alliances that have survived uh, and, and have continued, uh, whether I'm in it or, or I'm not. And so, so the, the idea that um, human beings have, uh, you know, I, at the end of the day, good. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've just recently been awarded the Letter Jacobs Prize, mm -hmm. which distinguishes uh, individuals in the field of emancipation. You know, first international recipient, so congratulations. Thank you. What is the significance of this award to you? Yeah. Now, I um, was very touched when they um, awarded me this prize. This is the first time, because the, the University of Grottingham um, celebrated the 400 years. So uh, this is a prize that they established um, several years ago, but they give it only once every two years. And it's usually to their own national. So this is the first time they've given it international to an international person. But what was very special was that I had the opportunity to learn more about her. And she is, was a very amazing human being because she, one would think that, okay, this is Netherlands, right? So you don't think of, of the people having to struggle to create the society that they have today, a much fairer society, and one that's more caring as well. 
but during her time, women wasn't allowed to go to university. So she was the first woman who went to university and she chose to do medicine. Mm, uh, and of course she was ridiculed, but not only her, but her brothers and her family, they were all ridiculed. Uh, but she, she kept on and eventually she became a doctor. But not only did she change her own circumstances, um, uh, but what was very inspiring was that she changed the circumstances of others. So she went to establish her clinics in uh, areas where women were not even supposed to be. So uh, in fact, at that, when, when I was there, uh, they had a premiere, there was a wonderful show which they, they kind of put on and, and it, um, uh, it showed that she, you know, she was working in some of the poorest areas. She was working with women uh, who were engaged with prostitution uh, uh, and, and, and she actually helped them and she understood the problems of uh, multiple births and, and the fact that women had no control over their own bodies and so on. And she was the one that designed the, the Dutch cap, the first uh, birth control. And so many of the feminists from the US went to study her methods as well. And then, and then uh, later on, when the First World War started, she and several other people uh, uh, actually organized against war. It was, uh, it was called Peace and Bread. Uh, and, and, and it was really um, uh, looking at, is this the way in which we resolve our differences? Because as long as we do not know how to resolve our differences, then we have to use war as a way of resolving uh, our, our differences. Um, uh, the, it's the whole destruction of life, and I think the 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 the, the stories of what happened to men uh, who have gone to war and the impact of that on their families and on their children and so on has been also quite uh, horrifying. So she organised against that, um, and they had the, uh, a peace conference, and they um, they were also very much involved with the right to vote because the, the suffrage movement uh, at that time because. When she was of age, she tried to vote and she was prevented from, uh, from voting. And her being her, she brought uh, the case to court. And uh, this is such a story because this is Netherlands again. So the court made a decision, but the decision was that only citizens could vote and only men could be citizens. So, you know, so when I was doing the, the, the work on <coughs> Afghanistan, I said, you know, this whole thing about women being equal citizens, uh, less than a hundred years ago or so, Netherlands also had the same problem. So, so this whole journey is because many people, you know, the, 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 the journey for equal rights and so on, is a journey that many people have, have undertaken. So I was very pleased. And, and she was also very inspiring because uh, obviously, you know, she had a whole group and then and, and um, she, she traveled. It wasn't, she was, and I think this is where they made the link with the, with the international because she did not just focus on, on the Netherlands. She even traveled, actually she even came to Asia. Uh, she came to Asia, she traveled to the Middle East, she went to Africa. And the whole thing at that time was because the world was, was in such a, a ferment and how do you ensure that in the state of social, social fermentation you actually am able to bring greater justice and greater fairness to as many people as possible. What do you want to see change in your lifetime? Hmm, what do I want to see change in, in my lifetime? I am very disturbed um, with some of the growth in extremisms and in divides. I think the idea I mean, we need to be able to think of a more um, interdependent world where there's greater social solidarity. So the issues of social exclusion uh, is, uh, has to be addressed. Disparities, growing disparities, it is not all right for, for such great disparities in wealth where in fact individuals, some individuals even have larger wealth than countries. Hmm? Uh, and it's not uh, all right uh, to have uh, what I see as avoidable hunger and poverty. I mean, in Asia alone, uh, we have 543 million people who go hungry every night. We have 1 billion people who work in vulnerable employment to keep their families and themselves going. Um, we have 162 million children who are stunted. 
So these are, 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 are issues that can be addressed. I mean, we have the technology, we have the wealth, we have the, the kind of knowledge. We cannot anymore say uh, in my lifetime that we do not have the know-how of addressing these issues. I think what we lack is the pol political will and the accountability framework. And, and, and it's unfortunate that many of our, uh, of our governments, uh, uh, although I work with, uh, with member states, the governance systems are still very problematic. So what I would like to see is greater accountability, better governance systems, not just of our governments, but also of our corporate sector. And I think that this is possible because at the end of the day, uh, what we want is more sustainable prosperity. And we can only have sustainable prosperity if we make sure that our disparities do not grow too wide, um, if we make sure that we know how to uh, uh, value the gifts of our ecosystem and, and, and realize that we only have one planet and that and therefore we are able to put both people and planet on the, the center of our development discussions. Do you think there are many other issues that have not been addressed adequately in our world today? I think the whole uh, issue of peace building and you know basically of uh, the link between peace, development, humanitarian uh, work, right? Because it is so unfortunate that um, if you look at where the forces that um, basically um, destroy our development gains, right? So of course uh, it is conflict, but, but increasingly it's also natural disasters. And Asia has been uh, very badly affected by natural disasters. In fact, a person living in Asia um, is exposed to natural disasters about 25 times more than uh, a person in Europe, four times more than a person living in Africa. So our, the greatest casualties of nat natural disasters happen to be here. Uh, and in 2011, when there was a great floods uh, hurting, uh, you know, uh, six countries, and then there were natural disasters around in, in our region and, uh, and so on. I mean, the, the, the region lost about $300 billion uh, in terms of um, damage and loss economically only, not talking about lives and property and so on. And, and I think that we need to be able to understand that we need to build resilience. I think that the whole uh, issue of, 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 of uh, resilience uh, to, to natural disasters, but also to shocks. I think uh, one of the things that um, absolutely has changed our development landscape is the issue of uncertainty. I think uncertainty now is a new normal and uncertainty and shocks happen to come from the uh, financial sector as you can see uh, you know, uh, as, as we, we unfortunately have had to, to, to experience and that uh, true and that hurt the real economy and, and as a result about 80 million uh, youth cannot find full employment. Huh? And then the other shocks, of course, is our natural disasters, but, but increasingly is also our demographic transitions, our changes, uh, shocks of families that, that, that uh, uh, our, so many of our people are aging and, then, and therefore we do not have the proper systems to take care of them and so on. Um, so, so there are many things that we, um, in the next uh, development journey um, in, in Asia, will have to, to, to deal with. Asia has done extremely well in terms of um, uh, halving the world's absolute poverty, but we cannot leave the other half behind. And we obviously uh, have to now undertake uh, the next development uh, journey in a more sustainable and a more equitable way. Now you've worked uh, in the field of women's rights and security in such a long time, you've seen the whole gamut of issues. What do you think are some of the issues that have not been addressed or needs to be addressed in the developed economy and as well as the developing economy with regards to women's issues? The whole uh, uh, area of voice and, and influence, I think, uh, I think uh, for um, and also the, the life-work balance uh, uh, or, um, uh, issues, uh, uh, issues of what people are now calling the care economy. I mean, how do you, how do you make sure that uh, you you are able to you know take care of the young and as as well as uh, as the like old. Um, I think the issue of aging as well as as uh, developing healthy 
uh, uh, generation uh, is 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 really critical. Women's role in that is, has always been very central, but but they can't be responsible for it alone. So so it's really the having uh, state accountability, uh, private sector accountability, looking at new ways of working, which 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 allows us to to actually um, take care of all. Is is there? I mean, that uh, is exactly it. Is the care? Is how do you care? for a changing demographic uh, population. At the end of the day, we need to be able to find um, a way of working that, that, that will uh, allow uh, us to use our potential, but at the same time care enough for our, for our people. And what are your dreams for the rights, for the women whose rights that you fight for? I think at the end of the day, uh, it's really about empowerment. It's, it's about them fulfilling their, their own creativity and, and really uh, be able to contribute. I think uh, all of us would like to, to leave this world uh, knowing that we have lived a meaningful, purposeful life and, and that we have contributed and that we have used our gifts and that our gifts have not been, been wasted and we have had the opportunity to make a difference. And um, for the people out there who want to create change but have no idea or uh, are grappling with how to go about doing it, what is your advice for them? Basically, uh, ask yourself what gives you the greatest meaning. Mm -hmm. And then you need to invest uh, in that. And, and you need to make time for it. Uh, and obviously, people like me made it a profession, uh, which means that you have to train. And then you have to be very good at it. You have to be. Uh, you have to develop all the skills that are necessary. Um, but not everyone wants to take that on as a profession. I mean, so 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 you can um, uh, contribute uh, in in different ways. Uh, and and I and and the most important thing is to be able to make sure that it comes from the depths of truth. Now I know you work a lot with uh, young men as well as young women, and um, I know you're very inspired by your work with them. And there are already men involved in this conversation, but how can we further encourage men to be part of the conversation about women's empowerment? Actually, they are already, which is, which is very good. Because you look at the new generation of men, you know, um, uh, you, they are more, more aware. And I was also very pleased because when the Secretary General um, launched this campaign on ending violence against women, I mean, he got the men involved, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So he got our leaders involved, he got many of the young men involved. Um, and, and, and I think the more uh, people are, are involved uh, in this collective work, I think the, the more sensitive they are. Uh, I mean, if you look now um, uh, at this rape case that happened in, in India, the whole population rose up, men and women. And, 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 uh, and that's a very good sign that, that uh, all of us would like together to have a different world. What do you think is lacking in this world today, Dr. Hazel? Many of us are still um, optimistic, right? Yeah. And, and, and we, we believe it's possible, uh, you know, we have hope. There are many people who live in hopelessness and, and, and uh, you look at the wars and you look at the, the fact that, you know, we have not been able to, to uh, prevent uh, some of the grievances, you know, uh, from turning into violence of the sort that, that we, we have experienced. We have not been able to provide uh, productive and, and uh, decent jobs to so many people so that uh, transnational crime becomes the alternative. We have not been able to inspire enough people so that they, they are able to, to journey on um, to help to become real co-creators of a, of a more equitable world and a more sustainable world. I think these are failings. I think we need to be able to, to do it better. And finally, what is empowerment to you? To, to be empowered means that you understand what power is. And, uh, and power cannot be power over. You can, you, we do not want dictators to, be <laughs> to have power <laughs> over everything and so on. It's power with, basically. You know, it's really understanding um, uh, you, that, that, that you have the power to, uh, to build with others, to generate alliances. You have the power within, you have uh, uh, the power of potential, you have power of dreams, you have uh, the, the power to, to transform the world and make it a better place. Well, Dr. Hazer, I just want to say thank you so much for your enduring passion and compassion towards humanity.
um, for being this amazing connector to the world. And personally, I'm so grateful that our world has someone like you. Well, thank, thank you so you. much. No, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. And all the best to you too. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Hazel. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Hazel's work is truly prolific and insights into the world invaluable. Let us all be encouraged that there are people out there like her fighting for the good of womankind.